So we are up to point B of unit one of God's economics. Unit one is biblical pictures of provision from Eden to Goshen. So we're looking at the scripture. We're going all the way back to the beginning to understand God's design and essentially how people have completely messed that up. But then how God chooses a people, enters into covenant with them, and is faithful to his covenant people even in the midst of a broken world that's only broken because mankind broke it. So point B is the curse, sweat and toil, thorns and thistles. So if you just listen to unit or uh, point A, you understand that there was no sweat and toil, there were no thorns and thistles in God's original design. But there was a command. And if you know the biblical story, which many of you, most of you do, you know that God gave a command to Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, all these things, you can eat any of these trees, all of this I created for you. You will not want, you will not hunger. As a matter of fact, I need you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth because I brought so much food. You know, you've got to start consuming all of this stuff. But he said, hey, but there's this one tree, just one, just this one tree. It's right in the middle of the garden. That one, don't eat that. Don't don't eat from that tree. That's all I ask. I've given all of this to you. That's all I ask. Just don't eat that one tree. Well, guess what? They did. You knew that already. But sometimes it's nice to remember the story in a dramatic way so that we remember where we got to or how we got to where we are now. Well, mankind disobeyed. But here's where it starts to get interesting, according to the lens of God's economics. Why did they disobey? They certainly doesn't, didn't disobey because they were hungry, because they were starving, because they were desperate. No, they had like thousands of trees to choose from with thousands of fruits on each tree to choose from. They were not hungry. There's something else going on about that tree. And it's not just that it was forbidden. There was something else in it for them. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We know that the serpent has come up to the woman and is entering into a dialogue with the woman, trying to get her. The serpent can't make you do anything. The enemy can't make you do anything. But the enemy can propose to you something that looks advantageous to you. And that's where we enter in at verse 6. The serpent has told her, hey, you need to eat that tree or from that tree that God told you not to. So we're at verse six. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, all right, she had plenty of food, right? But okay, yeah, this is edible. I can eat this, all right? And that it was a delight to the eyes. Ooh, this is pretty. Look at this. This is really, it. this is a beautiful fruit. Mm, look at that. Here we go. And that the tree was desired to make one wise. Here we go. She took of it. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So Adam wasn't far away. He was right there. He was standing right there. She saw that it was desired to make one wise. So let's dig into that word. That word in the Hebrew, I'm not going to pronounce it in, in Hebrew, but it the word means to be prudent, to be circumspect, uh, wisely or to wisely understand or to prosper. It includes the idea of causing to prosper or causing to have success. So let's do a word substitution there. And that the tree was to be desired to make one prosper. Hmm. All right. This is the same word that is used in Deuteronomy 29, uh, verse 9, which exhorts uh, all of Israel to obey the commands of the Lord your God so that you will prosper in all you do. So Eve is taking a look at this and she's like, hmm, if I eat that, then I'm going to prosper in all that I do. So this is the heart motivation behind why she 
did what she shouldn't have done. And Adam did it too. It was the hope of prosperity that aside, like how much more prosperous could they get? They had everything provided for them. They had more than enough, more than they could ever possibly consume. But yet they wanted to prosper outside of God's created order. It was desired to make them prosper. Well, because of this, you know, God steps in and starts to have a dialogue with the serpent and then also with mankind. So we're jumping through some parts because we're trying to stay focused on what this means and how this impacts the biblical picture between God and mankind as it pertains to God's economics. So the next verse there is Genesis 3, verse 17. And to Adam, he said, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. All right, so pause. Notice, God did not curse the man. God did not curse the woman. God cursed the ground because of man's sin. Do you see that? Okay, so mankind will experience a cursed existence. It will seem like he's cursed. It will feel like he's cursed because he used to be able to just walk around and like eat off of any tree and everything is provided just for him. It's easy. But now the ground is cursed and it's not going to produce the same way that it did before. Now, we're still very, very close to God's original design in the days of Adam and Eve, but the ground is cursed. So now let's say back to the apple analogy, one apple has five seeds in it. Well, because the ground is cursed, let's say only three of those seeds spring up as a tree. You start to see, or like I said, in in Eden or in God's design, there's no crop failure. Well, but if the ground is cursed, then there is potentially crop failure, where a whole crop that you think, oh, that's going to be my dinner for the next year. Well, if the crop fails, you got nothing. Now, what are you going to eat? You're going to have to go somewhere else and find some food somewhere. So God didn't curse mankind. He cursed the ground because of mankind's sin. But because the ground is cursed, mankind starts to live a cursed existence because he's now trying to survive rather than just enjoying the abundance that God created. All right, so God keeps going. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Guess what? In God's original design, there was no pain. No pain. Okay? You know, like everything was just already provided. Everything was perfect in God's design. The ground is now cursed. You're going to eat it in pain. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. In God's original design, no thorns and thistles. You're not spiking yourself every time you try to reach out to get some dinner. No, there are no thorns and thistles in God's design. But now that the ground is cursed, it's producing, ow, thorns and thistles that spike into you and cut your flesh. This is what will be brought forth. And you shall eat, listen to this, now you shall eat the plants of the field. Now, what did we learn in the last class? We learned that the plants of the field, that was the food for the beasts, okay? That was the food for the beasts and the birds and the creepy crawlers. Mankind wasn't eating that stuff. That was for them. But now God in his mercy, see, this is the beauty of God. God didn't curse mankind. He cursed the ground because of mankind's sin. The ground is like, what? I do to deserve that? Well, it's God's creation. That's the way it worked out. But in God's mercy, God knew, okay, if the ground is cursed, it's not going to produce as much as it did before. So even though this seems like a harsh punishment on mankind, what I'll do as a counterbalance is I'm going to enlarge the food supply. I'm going to expand the food supply. So mankind will no longer be limited to only fruit and being fruitarians, and they can only eat the plants yielding their seed and only eat the stuff coming off of the trees. But I'm going to enlarge their food supply so now they can eat the plants of the field also. So even in punishment, even in judgment, God remembers mercy. God takes no delight in destroying anyone. He, his desire is to bring people back to him, back to his original design. 
He loves people, but he also has to be just at the same time. Just meaning justice. He has to when punishment is due, he has to punish. He's God. He has to maintain things sovereignly in the earth according to his ultimate design and redemptive purpose. So that's where you see we open up. Now we're eating the plants of the field. If you like salad, that's really good news for you. I'm sure God's okay with a little dressing now and then. Go for it. It's all good. So Verse 19, by the sweat of your face, you will eat your bread. So now mankind before, he could just walk around the garden. You're not laboring. You're not sweating. You're not toiling. You not have no pain. You just walk up to a tree and take your food and you eat. You're done for the day, right? But now, because the ground is cursed, mankind is going to sweat. They're going to labor. They're going to have pain. This is how you're going to produce bread. You're going to have to work for it. Until you return to the ground, meaning until the day that you die. So God said, if you eat from the wrong tree, you're going to die. Well, now everyone who's descended from Adam, that means you, that means me, we're all going to die. So until you die and return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. So this is the original. This is the first picture of how mankind messed it up, and now we're in a different existence because of the curse on the ground, because of the sin of man, that now mankind isn't just walking around in God's amazing abundance. Now they're eating by the sweat of their brow with thorns and thistles to boot. Okay, so we're going to keep going. Fast forward. Adam and Eve, they have a son. His name is Cain. They have another son. His name is Abel. You might probably already be familiar with this story, but we're going to look again at it from the lens, through the lens of God's economics. The curse on Cain. The, the curse that was on Cain, God said, the land will no longer yield to you. So we're starting to see and establish a pattern right? But let's look at the story. So, you know, Adam and Eve, they have these two sons, and then it's time to bring an offering to God. Now, Abel brought an offering to God, and his heart was true. He brought it in faith. We know that because Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, Abel brought his offering. So there are lots of people making lots of guesses about, you know, Abel brought it and it had blood or this or that, and God likes blood for atonement. Well, God hadn't required blood for atonement yet. That wasn't, un- they were- mankind wasn't under the law for that yet, but yet God still honors sacrifice, I suppose. But God, what we do know from the whole Bible everywhere is that God is always looking at the heart and God is looking for a heart of faith. So we know from the, the Bible itself that Abel presented his offering by faith. Cain, on the other hand, he didn't present his offering by faith. He didn't present his offering with a right heart. So maybe Cain brought his offering just because he thought like, hey, this is the right thing to do. Or like, oh, I guess it's like time to offer the sacrifice now. And I don't know if I really believe this, but I'm going to bring some of my crops and, you know, offer it to God because, you know, that seems like what my brother's doing. And Okay. You know, we don't know what was going through Cain's mind. We know that Abel brought his by faith. Well, then God looked favorably upon Abel's offering, but he did not have regard for Cain's offering. So Cain, he got a little pouty about that. Like, hey, man, what about my offering? What's the deal? Why, why do you like his and not mine? So he got a little bit more than just a little pouty. He got so angry and so jealous that he plotted and killed Abel. He killed his brother. And so God then has to confront Cain and say, hey, where is your brother? What, what's going on? What, what have you done? And Cain gives this explanation. Well, you know, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, like, what's the big deal, man? So God knows already what Cain has done. And now Cain, because he has done this, is warranting punishment. He's warranting judgment from God. So that's where we're going to pick up at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 11, starting with verse 11. And now, this is God speaking to Cain. God says, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your 
brother's blood from your hand. It's God saying, you shed your brother's blood. The the blood was poured into the ground, and now the ground will no longer yield for you. He says, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So God sends Cain away. Cain is going into exile. So that was part of Adam and Eve's punishment. When they disobeyed, they were sent to the east. They were sent to into exile away from the Garden of Eden. And then God put cherubim with flaming swords to guard the way to the garden. Well, now Cain, he has disobeyed even more aggressively, rebelled against God and his way. He's killed his own brother. And so he is being sent into even further exile away from the presence of God, away from the blessing of God. And God's saying, the ground is not going to yield for you. You're going to be a fugitive and a wanderer. And Cain, he immediately got it. He understood. He said, he cried out, my punishment is more than I can bear. He knew that this was going to mean great, great difficulty for him and his life. Now, let's think about that for a moment. See, sometimes this is why it's valuable to look at the scripture through different lenses, because if you're only looking at the scripture As far as it pertains to, yes, I'm all for the Old Testament. We have all these pictures and shadows of Jesus. Like, yes, Jesus is the greater Abel, and that's wonderful. You can talk about all sorts of different things when you're looking at passages, and you can look at them from a theological perspective. You can look at them from this way and that way. But it is valuable to look at these scriptures through different lenses to understand more depth of what God is communicating through these various stories. But here's the deal. What Cain understood was that if the ground was not going to yield for him, then what was he going to have to do? He was going to have to take food. Where was he going to get food if the ground was not going to produce food for him? Let's say, just imagine this. I'm not saying this is what was happening, but let's say, you know, Cain walked up to a tree and whatever tree that Cain tried to eat from, the tree shriveled up and died so that he wouldn't have any food, right? I'm not saying that that's what this is saying, but if the ground, you got a picture Cain knows, okay, the ground is no longer going to yield to me, and I've been sent away as a wanderer into this desert wasteland. This is a problem. How am I going to eat? And this is what he understood. If I'm going to eat, I'm going to have to go either submit myself to somebody else who has food and live under their domination for the rest of my life. Or if I'm going to maintain any semblance of independence, I'm going to go have to invade them and steal their food. I'm going to go have to steal food from someone who the ground is yielding to. So, And, you know, what does he have to barter with? He has nothing to barter with. So he's either going to have to barter or steal or kill. He's going to have to kill more people in order to get food and provision for himself. Well, what happens when you start stealing people's stuff or killing someone's dad so that you can feed yourself and your family? What do you make a lot of when you start living that way? You make a lot of enemies right? So it starts to put the pieces together. Cain is like, ah, my punishment is more than I can bear. And then he's like, they're going to kill me. You know, like I'm going to go steal someone's food. And then anybody who sees me, they're going to kill me. And God's like, no, no, I'll take care of that. You know, I'm going to put a mark on you so that nobody is going to try to kill you, right? So they'll know there's a, there's a sevenfold vengeance for anyone who tries to kill Cain. Nope. No one, you're, you're going to hope to be dead because your life is going to be in such a cursed state, but I'm not going to allow anybody to kill you. You're going to have to scrape by on your own because you shed the blood of your brother and the ground is not going to yield for you. So you, you, that's, this is the punishment, right? So where do we go from there? We're moving through. This is all in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4 is loaded. I encourage you at the end of this audio portion, go read Genesis 4. There is so much in there. Well, Cain went on, so he's now living in this cursed existence. The ground is not yielding to him. What did he do? Cain is the first person in the whole Bible to build a city. He built a city. Now, Okay, the Garden of Eden, the garden had no walls. There were no walls. 
because, you know, there was no violence. God, God's design doesn't need walls to separate people from people. God's design doesn't need walls to separate people. Hey, my stuff from your stuff. You know, like even little kids when they're in the back of the car and you want to get like a piece of tape and put it between them. He's touching me. He's touching me. He's crossing the line. You know, like this is what walls are for, to keep people from fighting. The Garden of Eden had no walls. Cities have walls. Cities have walls, and they also have warriors to defend the resources. A city wall is made of, let's get all of our stuff on the inside of the wall so that our stuff is safe and our enemies can't get to our stuff. We're going to defend our resources so that it's all ours and nobody else's, right? Warriors are there to protect the city wall, but it's still all about resources. So especially when your food and your supplies are procured through theft and violence, enemies are going to come try to attack you. If you're just living in a tent, guess what? That's easy pickings for your enemies to come get their stuff back. But if you have a city wall, it's a lot harder for them to come and steal their stuff back from you who stole it from them. Everyone's just trying to survive. This is immediately, as soon as mankind's existence becomes cursed. You see that the, the violence, the wickedness that we have, even up to the world today, what are people fighting over? Resources. What are people creating cities and vaults and protection for? Resources. It's all about resources. That's where the violence comes from. So Cain was also, his descendants were still in Genesis 4. You go down the line into Cain's descendants. Cain's descendants were the first ones. They became increasingly violent. They became increasingly vengeful. And they are the first ones to introduce polygamy. So one of Cain's uh, descendants, it's the seventh one from Cain, his name is Lamech, or you might pronounce that Lamech. I've heard it a couple different ways. I think biblically with the Semitic languages, it's Lamech. But if you want to call him lame, I think he's lame too. Okay. So Lamech, he was the first to have two wives. Now, you know, in different cultures, we have different opinions about what that's really all about. But from this perspective, the, the having two wives, this is a form of if one man has enough wealth to provide for more than one woman. If you are a woman and there's no man who has enough to provide for you, then being a man's wife, even though he has another wife, looks like a pretty good deal. So you see, this is all tied into survivalism. If a man was wealthy enough to have two wives, if a man was wealthy enough to have five wives or seven wives, then he was providing for these women whose job was to stay in the home and cook and, and take care of the, the household, right, to provide. The, the, to cook the food and prepare all of that. So a man having enough resources to have more than one wife, it was a good deal for the guy. It was a good deal for the woman. So they were the first ones to become polygamous. So this is, again, all tied to they're surviving because the ground is not yielding to them. So they're coming up with all of these various ways of surviving. They also became increasingly violent. So again, Lamech, he, again, lame, he's lame, uh, but he sings a song about how violent he is. He actually has a little song in Genesis 4 that he sings, and he's like, listen up, you wives of mine. You know, Cain, he is, if his vengeance is this much, is sevenfold, then my vengeance is 77-fold. I'm going to, I killed a man just for, you know, looking at me the wrong way, and I killed a young man. Man, you know, just because. So like Cain, uh, sorry, Cain's descendants, Lamech is so violent, he's taking Cain's violence to a whole new level. But this is where the world gets all of its wickedness and its violence, not all of it, but you see how people, they start when they're starting to just survive and they're starting to look out just for number one, me, 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 me and my household. How are we going to, you know, get what we need? I don't care if it's at your expense. I need what I need. I got to feed my household. I got to feed my own self. So having a cursed land leads to selfishness. It leads to violence. It leads to wickedness because it becomes, many of you have heard this expression, it becomes survival of the fittest.
You know, if you have bigger weapons, then you can overpower me and you can take advantage of all of my resources. Well, this is what has gotten mankind into trouble again and again and again and again. So all of this type of violence and selfishness and wickedness is exactly what spread throughout all the earth and led to the judgment at the days of the flood, the flood of Noah. So we'll take a look that we're up to Genesis 6 now, Genesis 6 verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw, so wait, pause for a second there. The earth was filled with violence. What was, mankind had a job. Their job was to fill the earth. Their job was to fill the earth by multiplying themselves to tend and keep in good working order according to God's design to tend and keep the world. That's what they were supposed to fill the world with. But instead, the earth was filled with what? with violence. The earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. That's all. Okay, this is not limited now. By Genesis 6, we've gone through 10, well, 9, 10 generations from Adam and Eve, 9 generations from Cain. So we've gone 9 generations later, and this is now all flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. All the descendants of Cain, all the descendants of Adam and Eve are all included in this. Everybody's just trying to survive with the ground being cursed, with the sweat of their brow, with the thorns and the thistles. It's a tough life. It's survival of the fittest. So the earth is filled with violence because all flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. And in the next uh, next point, we will start to talk about how Noah, God gave Noah favor, God God uh, redeemed Noah out of the flood, and then Noah goes on. That's another picture that we're going to look at, but we'll stop for today. So God bless you, and just uh, meditate a little while on how mankind had everything available to them, but then through you know increasing wickedness and turning from God, we've come to the point where the earth is filled with violence rather than being filled with the goodness and glory of God. <laughs> 